This is movement of air over the respiratory surface. So fish ventilate their lungs by allowing water to move in through their, or not their lungs, their gills, by allowing water to move in through the mouth and then out through the gills. So we can talk about ventilation of gills, but here we're talking about the ventilation of the lungs. And you'll remember that I said something that when we were talking about amphibian lungs and reptilian lungs, that they actually have to force air down into their lungs. The mammals have another mechanism and it is referred to as negative pressure breathing. And this is versus positive pressure that we would see like in the frog or the reptile. Okay. So negative pressure breathing is believed to be more um, efficient at getting oxygen into the lungs and getting CO2 out of the lungs. So maybe that's why it evolved in the um, endotherms, and it has to do with the presence of the diaphragm. So when we look at the diaphragm, it sits under the lungs. So I'm just going to draw my trachea and then my bronchi, right? And then I have my lungs right here, like two balloons, okay? So the diaphragm at rest is dome shaped like this. Okay. So this is the diaphragm and it is at rest. So it is actually pushing up on the lungs. And so this is going to decrease the volume of the lungs and it's actually going to increase the pressure, right? So we have an increase in pressure and we have a decrease in uh, lung volume. So that's the amount of air that is in the lung. Okay. So if I'm pressing up on the lungs, how is air going to move? Is it going to move into the lungs or out of the lungs? If there's an increase in pressure inside the lungs, what's going to happen? It's going to move out, right? If I push up on those balloons, then we're going to have air out, right? And this is called exhalation, right? We're exhaling. So what happens when the diaphragm contracts is it actually moves down and it gets flatter. So it looks more like this. So if I have my trachea, my bronchi, Right, and my lungs, and my diaphragm has moved down and has become flatter. So it, when the diaphragm contracts, right, it gets, it moves down and becomes flatter. So if I move that diaphragm down, then what's going to happen is this is going to decrease pressure-wise, and I'm going to get an increase in the lung volume. So what happens is, is that the air is automatically sucked into the lungs. And so this is the idea of negative pressure breathing. So this is air in. And this is inhalation. Sometimes these are called expiration and inspiration to inspire, to breathe in, right? But inhalation is another word for that. So this is the negative pressure. So what that means is I do not have to force oxygen or air down into my lungs to fill them. When my diaphragm contracts, air automatically moves in. Now, this is kind of confusing to a lot of people because when they think about the muscles, the breathing muscles, they are thinking about our rib cage. So the rib cage also plays an important role because if I inhale, I can expand my ribs, I can lift them up, and that also increases 
the um, increases the volume of my lungs and more air will move in. So if I move my, my rib cage when I breathe, I'm going to ventilate my lungs better. Okay? So this is kind of the opposite of what people think because when they think of contracting, they're thinking about my contracting my rib cage or contracting my belly and forcing air out. Right? So those are different muscles that aid in respiration, but when the diaphragm contracts, air is actually brought in. So this is opposite of what you would think. And so you might want to put a little star there and say opposite of what you might think because you're thinking of the different muscles, the muscles, your intercostal muscles, your rib muscles, and your abdominal muscles, which also aid in breathing. Okay, so in your book, they have a diagram that shows these two things working together, the rib cage and the diaphragm. So remember, the diaphragm sits underneath the lungs and separates the thoracic body cavity from the abdominal body cavity. Okay, and so this just shows inhalation where the diaphragm moves down, but notice I'm also lifting my rib cage up and exhalation where the diaphragm actually relaxes because it moves up and it becomes more dome shaped. And so when it relaxes, it forces air out. Okay. So that is what is referred to as positive, or excuse me, negative pressure breathing. Yes. Does the have anything to do with it? Um, yes, it's spasms of the diaphragm cause the hiccups. Yeah, so you can have muscular spasms in your is diaphragm. Like Yes, because it's it's coordinated by your, your part of your brain that's unconscious. So it's medulla oblongata. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions about this? Okay. So we're going to talk a little bit about some, um, or how we regulate respiration first, and then we'll talk about some respiratory disorders. So when we look at the regulation of the respiratory system, it is unconscious. And it is part of the brain, which is called the brain stem, which is the medulla oblongata. And this is the brain stem. So this is unconscious. So sometimes people can go and become brain dead. And when you're brain dead, that means that there's no electrical activity in your conscious part of your brain. So that would be like in the cerebral cortex, we're gonna talk about the brain next. Um, so when you are brain dead, you can still breathe, you can actually still blink, you can actually still move your eyes, you might even, you can actually swallow, right? But you're not uh, technically considered to be alive because your conscious part of your brain has died and has stopped transmitting electrical signals, okay? So when we look at the regulation, this is measures, or there are what are called chemoreceptors, which are specialized neurons that detect blood pH. And we talked a little bit about blood pH when in Biology 101, but the um, lower the pH, the more acidic. And the higher the pH, the more basic. And neutral is seven. So pH of seven is water and pure water, and it is neutral. Okay. So the reason why blood pH and respiration are directly linked is because of carbon dioxide, which is CO2. So this is a waste product of cellular metabolism, cellular breakdown of nutrients to produce energy. And when this combines with water in your blood, it produces carbonic acid, which is an HT, H2CO3. So this is carbonic acid. Okay. And so what is, this is going to do is this is going to decrease the pH. So the more CO2 that you produce, so say for example, with exercise, so we looked at exercising, right? Your muscles produce more CO2.
what this is going to do is this is going to decrease your blood pH. And this is going to be signaled or detected in the medulla oblongata, which is our control center. And this increases breathing rate. And so what that means is you get rid of CO2 and you return the, um, the blood pH to normal. So this removes CO2, right? And then returns blood pH to normal. So it's a negative feedback mechanism. So that's the major way that, or the reason why when you exercise, you have to breathe more, is to get rid of that CO2. So let's say that you are um, hyperventilating. So that means that you're breathing too much. And you can cause yourself to hyperventilate. So um, if you're, um, say for example, if you want to win the how long you can hold your breath in, under, the, under the water in the pool contest this summer, right? What you want to do is you want to breathe. So, you know, I did this a couple summers ago in Rhode Island, right? And Gary and I were like, we're just hyperventilating right before, and everybody's like, what the heck are they doing, you know? And then we get down there, and it's a tie, right? <laughs> My husband and I. So if you hyperventilate and then go under, you're going to be able to hold your breath for longer because your CO2 levels are going to be depleted. And then you're going to have to um, uh, build up more CO2 before it actually feels like you need to breathe again. So when a person is having an anxiety attack and is hyperventilating, why do you think you have them breathe into a bag? So there's CO2 in the bag. So I'm breathing into the bag and then I'm breathing out. And that CO2 that I'm breathing back into my lungs is preventing carbon dioxide from re-entering into my system. So I'm re-breathing uh, old air that has high levels of CO2, so I'm not going to lose as much CO2 to my environment, so that is gonna bring my CO2 levels back to normal, right? So breathing in a bag if you're hyperventilating can be helpful because it can really quickly um, uh, reduce, or excuse me, it can really quickly increase the levels of CO2 in your blood. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay. Why is it that like if you hyperventilate for like too long, you can get stuck for like, twenty? You can get stuck in one position physically. You mean? Like yeah, like if you hyperventilate like, too long. Like, I don't know. Can you give an example of? Like if you hyperventilate for a long time, and then like then you could become lightheaded. So you become lightheaded maybe, and you just can't move. It might be affecting your pH so much that it's affecting the ability of your body to function, right? Because we have to maintain a relatively stable pH and it's actually slightly basic. So normal blood pH is slightly uh, basic. So it is actually about a 7.45. So it's above seven, so it's more basic. And so you can actually die if it gets too low and die if it gets too high. So you want to um, regulate that. Okay. Okay, so let's talk about respiratory disorders. So when we talk about asthma, one of the weird things about asthma and other allergies is, is that they're, for some reason, becoming more common. And they're actually more common in industrialized countries and developed countries than they are in not industrialized countries. So there's lots of questions as to why that is the case. But asthma is a reaction that causes constriction in the airways, specifically in the bronchi, bronchi, bronchi and the bronchioles. So we'll put bronchioles. So the bronchioles are the small tube ways that are leading to the, um, to the alveoli. So this is generally due to an allergen. So 
So an allergen could be like, for example, pet dander. Pollen, etc. Okay. But in some cases, it can actually also be due to exercise and the temperature of the air. Okay, so it could be like maybe cold air breathing in causes the constriction of the bronchioles and you cannot breathe. Okay. So um, if, what do people with asthma, what do they typically carry around with them? An inhaler. So an inhaler has a chemical, right, called um, albuterol. And this dilates or increases the diameter of the bronchioles. So it's a bronchial dilator. So it's a, a chemical that mimics actually, an, uh, or yeah, so it mimics a neurotransmitter that actually causes the bronchioles to open back up. Now this is different from bronchitis. So this is inflammation of the bronchii. Of the bronchi, generally. It's those big two bronchi that branch off the trachea. So itis means inflammation, bronch means, right? And so that kind of makes sense, that word, you can figure that out. But the thing that's the difference between the asthma and the bronchitis is this is a productive cough with mucus. Um, some people can get it and it can lead to what we're gonna talk about next, which is chronic obstructive disorder, no, pulmonary disorder. Yeah, um, it, it is a disorder because it's, it's not a, is it, well, it's a disease. I'm not sure what a disorder is. I don't know why it wouldn't be a disorder as asthma is. This is not the body walk working function. So I guess maybe you're thinking that it is a defense mechanism. Bronchitis. Not always, right? And so the thing about bronchitis is it can be viral or bacterial. So which one can be fixed, fixed with an antibiotic? Bacterial, okay? So if it is viral and you're producing mucus, then it cannot be cured with antibiotics. So a lot of, you know, people go in and if they're coughing, like I, if I went in, they'd probably give me some antibiotics because I've been sick and coughing, but I'm pretty sure it's not um, bacteria. I'm pretty sure it's viral and it's allergies. And so I just don't go to the doctor unless I get really sick and like if I'm coughing up green stuff, then green suggests that it's bacteria, right? Colored stuff suggests that it's bacteria, but if it's clear, not white, but if it's clear, then it suggests that it's a viral infection, right? So a lot of people take a lot of, of antibiotics when they don't really need to, right? And that can mess with your microbiome, right? So you only wanna take those antibiotics when you absolutely have to. Okay, so this, the asthma is a dry cough. So that's one way to tell whether or not your coughing is asthmatic or if it's bronchitis. Yes. So asthma that anything like it's not really a gender trend because my dad and my brother both have asthmatic symptoms, but none of my sisters or my mom have anything. You know, I I would think it might be more common in women, if anything. And it does have a predis you have a predisposition that's gen it seems to be a genetic thing. So allergies run in families. So if you have a family, your mom or dad or have allergy problems, then you're probably going to get them too. My dad does and my brother is showing this symptoms, yeah. but none of, my, none of the rest of my family. Interesting. Interesting. Well, thank experience. goodness, huh? That's a blessing. <laughs> yeah. My sister has it, and they told me that I have something called asthma, so like I only get it when it doesn't change it. Right, so that asthma is probably brain. has to do with allergens. Although, yeah. 
Yeah, allergies are interesting because they can be caused by um, other things than physical things. Okay, so the next one is emphysema. Oops. Okay, so in when we were doing tissues in lab, we looked specifically at normal lung, the normal alveoli, and the um, alveoli of people that have emphysema. And what was a characteristic? <clears throat> Remember that difference in tissue. What was one characteristic of a person that had emphysema? So you think about the characteristics of the respiratory membrane, right? They need to be thin. So in emphysema, the respiratory membrane thickens. So you get a thickening of the respiratory membrane. Right? And the alveoli themselves become damaged. And there is no um, what do I want to say? Alveoli are damaged. Oh, there's a loss, a loss of surface area. So the primary cause of emphysema today is smoking. Right? But in the past, it could have also been, um, because we have OSHA laws and clean air laws, a lot of our air has been, it been cleaned up. But it could also be due to chemicals in the air. Yeah, so if you're talking about Beijing, then emphysema could be caused because, you know, you see those pictures of the smog and they're all wearing masks, right? And that is because they're trying to protect their lungs so that they don't get emphysema. So smoking in the United States is the primary reason and probably in developed countries where we don't have a lot of pollution, where we have Clean Air Act, you know, we can't, you can't just spew stuff into the air. Um, and then also, so chemicals, these could be like manufacturing, So my husband's grandpa actually worked in a textile factory where they were making the webbing for, um, for chairs, outdoor chairs. And that was before they had rules about chemical pollutants in the air. And he actually got sick from the manufacturing job, right? And so um, this could also be coal dust. So in the past, right, during the Industrial Revolution, and even today, when we have coal miners, they are much more likely to get emphysema. And so these are the people that you see that um, tend to have to have um, oxygen tanks. Okay, so these oxygen tanks have air with an elevated level of oxygen. Right. So this makes oxygen more readily diffusible into the blood. So we increase the oxygen diffusing into the blood. Okay. I think I mentioned oxygen tanks before because you can get altitude sickness if you go hike up a mountain and you're not used to the altitude and you don't have enough red blood cells. Right? And so that's why you have to take oxygen with you because up at high mountains, there's less oxygen available. Okay. So we're just going to watch a, a video about when kind of emphysema gets really bad, it turns into what is called COPD. So this is called chronic obstructive pulmonary disorder. Okay. So this is COPD um, is also linked to emphysema and to cigarette smoke as well. So let me see if I can find my video. I forgot to put that up here. Okay. 
Understanding Chronic Obstructive Pulmonary Disease, COPD. Chronic Obstructive Pulmonary Disease, or COPD, is a lung disease that makes it difficult to breathe. COPD is a long-term disease that often gets worse over time and is characterized by inflammation and severe limitation of airflow in and out of the lungs. COPD is an umbrella term used to describe a group of breathing conditions, most common being chronic bronchitis and emphysema. Many people living with COPD may have both emphysema and chronic bronchitis. A few people have both asthma and COPD. Cigarette smoking is the leading cause of COPD. Long-term exposure to secondhand smoke or irritants such as air pollution, dust, or workplace fumes, and biomass exposure such as wood smoke can also contribute to COPD. An uncommon genetic disorder called alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency is sometimes associated with COPD. Although respiratory infections, such as influenza and pneumonia, do not cause COPD, they can make people with COPD very sick. Therefore, it is very important to keep these vaccinations up to date. At first, COPD may cause no symptoms or only mild symptoms. As the disease progresses, common symptoms include shortness of breath, wheezing, and chest tightness, especially with exercise and an ongoing cough, often with a lot of mucus. As COPD symptoms worsen, breathing requires much more energy, and it can get harder to exercise or do routine activities like getting dressed or climbing stairs. This may lead to fatigue, weight loss, and muscle loss. People with COPD can experience a variety of symptoms. Different stages of COPD range from mild to moderate to severe. In normal functioning lungs, when air is inhaled, it travels down the windpipe and into the airways, or bronchial tubes, of the lungs. Inside the lungs, the airways branch out into smaller and smaller tubes, called bronchioles, that are rich in blood supply. At the end of these tubes are billions of tiny air sacs, called alveoli. Normally, the walls of the airways and air sacs are elastic and flexible in nature. Inhaling causes each air sac to fill with air. Exhaling causes each air sac to deflate. Efficient uptake of air into the lungs provides oxygen to the blood, which is then carried to all parts of the body. In COPD, however, the airways become thick and inflamed, and they produce more mucus than usual. This mucus can clog the airways and makes it hard to breathe. In COPD, the walls of the air sacs in the lungs are damaged and lose their elastic quality. The air sacs get floppy, broken, and lose their shape. As the air spaces get larger, air gets trapped, and there are fewer air sacs to supply oxygen to the blood. Because air is trapped in these air sacs, it is difficult for lungs with COPD to deflate like normal lungs. This trapped air makes it harder to get fresh air into the lungs and makes breathing more difficult. COPD is the third leading cause of death in the United States and affects more than 13.5 million Americans. It is predominantly diagnosed in middle-aged individuals older than 40 years and is present in both women and men. Although COPD is more common in men, more women die from this disease each year than men. The rate of COPD continues to increase worldwide due to smoking and worsening air pollution. While there is no cure for COPD, you can take steps to feel better, stay more active, and slow disease progression. COPD can be managed by consulting early with your healthcare provider, seeking diagnosis and intervention therapies, and adopting lifestyle changes that include quitting smoking, pulmonary rehabilitation, healthy eating and exercise, and maintaining a positive outlook. Okay. Okay, so are there any questions about that? Oops, no idea what this video is on. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> okay. 
Okay, so on your syllabus, um, it says that we are going to talk about the muscular and the skeletal system next, but we are behind. And so I'm gonna skip over that. And so we are not gonna talk about the muscular and the skeletal system. So we're gonna talk about tissues, um, excuse me, the nervous system and nervous tissue. And then we're gonna talk about sensory systems and then we're gonna talk about reproduction and then that will be the end of the quarter. Okay, so I'm making kind of a midterm adjustment just based upon the time that we have. Can I say general question? So if mentioned pneumonia, how is, is that like also a respiratory disorder? Or that, that is a respiratory disorder. So pneumonia happens when mucus gets trapped in the lungs and then you get a bacteria, you get the pneumonia, which is a bacteria. And so that could be a reason for why people with COPD die, is as they get that bacterial infection and then it causes them to die. So yeah, so COPD makes it more likely that you're going to get pneumonia, which is why there is a vaccine for it. And flu, the flu vaccine is really important to get that too, if you have that. Sorry, I'm looking at house. Oh, okay. Thank you. Okay. Okay, so um, when we talk about nervous tissue, remember that we were talking about or we've talked about neurons, right? These are the, the cells that are capable of sending a signal from one part of the body to another. And then we talked about glial cells and how these are actually helper cells. Okay, so those are the ones that surround the individual neurons and provide nutrition, but they also have to regulate the environment and they also help to speed up the conduction of um, the impulse from one part of the body to another. Okay, so we're gonna talk about the structure of a neuron. So because this is a single cell, we have what is called the cell body. And this contains the nucleus. So that's where the genetic material is located. But it also contains organ organelles that are capable of producing neurotransmitters. So neurotransmitters are the chemicals that are involved in communication in the nervous system. Hormones are the chemicals that are involved in the endocrine system, right? So glands produce hormones, nerves release neurotransmitters, and then there's an interaction between the nervous system and our endocrine system. So like the hypothalamus is both nervous tissue and endocrine tissue. So sometimes neurotransmitters and hormones um, are, are the same thing, one and the same thing. So we also have what are called dendrites, and this means branching. So dendrology is the study of branching patterns. And so the dendrites are um, cytoplasmic extensions off the cell body. And generally there is many of those, so there tend to be many. Right. And what these do is, is that they bind uh, neurotransmitters that have been released by other neurons. So we'll talk about those, but there's little receptors that the neurotransmitters bind to, and then they can actually cause a signal to be generated by the um, cell body. So we also have what is called an axon. So this also is an extension of the cell, and it can actually be very long. We'll talk about how some axons can extend from your spinal cord all the way down to the tip of your large toe. So this is an extension of the cell, um, cell body. And generally there is only one, right? We'll just say there's only one. Sometimes there's two, but we're just gonna say there's only one. And then um, these release neurotransmitters.
So if we look at a diagram of a um, neuron from your textbook, you should be able to identify these different parts, right? And so this is my cell body right here. These are my dendrites, and notice how there's many, many dendrites, okay? This is actually a, neur a neuron that is making a connection or synapsing with this neuron. So in kind of a lighter color, that's another neuron. And then this one extension that is coming down here is what is referred to the axon, right? These are glial cells, which we'll talk about what they're doing there surrounding the axon. And then they release neurotransmitters into the synapse. So I'm gonna write synapse and define it as the space between two neurons. There's also a thing that happens when you learn something new and in your brain, and this is called synaptogenesis. And what do you think that means? What does genesis mean? The production of, right? So synaptogenesis like occurs during learning. when new connections are made. Okay. So that was kind of the anatomy of the neuron. But we, what we really want to know is how the neuron works. And so this is its physiology, right? How does the neuron work? Right. And in this case, the work that is done is electrochemical energy, right? So we have electrochemical energy. So electro, electric energy, is the movement of charged particles. So when we're talking about our electrical system in our house or in this room, what are the charged particles that are traveling? What are they in this room? What's traveling through the wires? Oh. Electrons, right? So in we, but we don't have electrons running around in our body because electrons are really damaging. And so we use ions, right? And so instead of electrons, we have ions and this includes sodium, which is Na positive. So the elemental, uh, uh, symbol for sodium is Na, and then it has a positive charge. And so the flow of sodium ions is electrical energy, right? So it's the same type of energy, it's just the movement, it's not the movement of electrons, it's the movement of, of um, different ions. And then we also have potassium. Does anybody know what is the elemental symbol for potassium? K, right? And then we also have chloride which is Cl, and is it a negative or a positive? It's a negative. Okay. So that's the charged ions. So what we wanna ask is how do these charged ions, the relative amount of charged ions and the movement of these charged ions differ when a neuron is at rest versus when it's sending a signal, sending an impulse, okay? So we're gonna put at rest. Okay. So what we're gonna look at is what is referred to as the membrane potential. So this is the difference in charge between the inside of the axon and the outside of the axon. So difference in charge.
between, we're going to just talk about the axon, between the inside and outside of axon. So it is at rest a positive 70 millivolts. Okay. That's the same unit that we would measure voltage. Like if I was to make sure uh, said one of these worked, I could put a voltmeter in my plug and I could see if there's voltage going on in there, right? So this is the same thing. They can stick a little electrode into the um, neuron and they can measure the differences in charge. So when we look at this, this is my axon, this is outside, and this is inside. Oops, not inside, inside, sorry, inside. So this is my, this is like a, a section through the axon. Okay, so I would put positive, positive, positive here on each side, and then I would put negative, negative, negative. Okay. So that is, that part of the axon is at rest, okay? When it's not at rest, it's said to be generating an action potential. So an action potential is what is the impulse. or signal that is being transmitted. And it transmits down the length of the axon from the cell body to the very ends of the axons. And then that signal ultimately causes neurotransmitters to be released into the synapse. So when we look at the action potential, it is um, a positive 30 millivolts. Oh, shoot. Did I screw that up? I did. Oh, sorry. This is a negative 70. Sorry, put negative on there. And so we're going to put negative here and negative here and a positive here. I don't know why I did that. Okay. So it is a positive 30. Okay. So when I look at this diagram, this is actually my action potential. So I'm just going to abbreviate that as AP. That's my action potential. That's my stimulus. And this is at rest. Because the inside is negative compared to the outside, which is why it's negative 70 millivolts. Okay. So what this action potential is going to do is it's going to move like a wave down the axon, behind it it's going to be restored, and in front of it more action potentials are going to be produced. And it is this movement of charged particles that causes, um, that is what is referred to as um, an action potential. Okay. So if we look at a diagram of this over time, so this is another diagram from your book, right? So this is time. This is my membrane potential, right? This is a, a neuron at rest, right? So something happens here to stimulate my neuron. So maybe some neurotransmitters bind. Maybe it's a receptor that is absorbing the stimuli from the environment, like sound or, or chemical, right? And then it moves towards the threshold. So I'm going to put negative 55 millivolts is what is called the threshold potential. Okay. So once reached, an action and an all or none. action potential is produced. Okay. So the point here is, is that there's no really strong action potentials, no weak action potentials. All action potentials are exactly the same. Right? So if an action potential is being, is being produced in my nose because I'm smelling something, 
it actually gets transmitted as this electrical chemical energy into my brain where I can consciously perceive it as smell. Or when somebody touches my arm, I can consciously perceive that because the action potential is said to that part of my brain that is associated with touch on that particular part of my body. So all of your um, sensory information travels via action potentials. So you'll notice that once it reaches the threshold, then it goes up. And this is actually called depolarization. So moving from negative 70 millivolts to a positive 30 millivolts is called depolarization. And the reason for that is if you think about polarity, negative 70 is moving towards zero. And then it overshoots zero, and it actually becomes polar again. But that's what is called depolarization, because negative 70, um, the threshold moves to zero and then overshoots it. Okay. So repolarization is when it goes back down. So from a positive 30 back to a negative 70 millivolts, that is repolarization. And then you'll notice hyperpolarization. This is where it goes under negative 70 millivolts, okay? So you need to know these different parts of the graph. So threshold, this would be resting. Threshold is in dotted, right? When it's going up, this would be depolarization, repolarization, hyperpolarization, and then it goes back to normal. And this has to do with the movement of ions, but we're not gonna get into that much detail, but it has to do with the flow of sodium ions in and potassium ions out. So it's the flow of ions into and out of the axon that causes this difference in charge. And this whole process of keeping the, um, the uh, neurons all ready to produce an action potential is actually very energetically expensive. So it takes a lot of energy to do this. And so brains tend to be limited, um, like brain size, there's a trade-off. So if you have a larger brain, you're gonna need more energy. And so some organisms have um, evolved to have smaller um, brains because it doesn't require as much energy and you wouldn't expect them to have it unless there's a great benefit for them to, to develop a large brain, okay? So it's a trade-off because of the cost of the nervous, maintaining the nervous tissue. There's a really interesting study. We used to think that brains did not change over the course of an adult organism's lifetime. But there's a really interesting study that they found in chickadees, which these are small birds that over winter by caching food. And what I mean is that they hide food right? So that takes a lot of nervous tissue to remember where you have hidden all your food. These are the ones that go chickadee, dee, 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 right? And they're in the forest, like if you're hiking in the woods and in the middle of winter, it can be really cold and they're going chickadee, dee, 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 right? So um, these chickadees, um, when they are going into winter or fall and winter in the fall, their hippocampus, and does anybody know what the hippocampus is specifically associated with? Memory. So the hippocampus part of the brain increases in size. Okay. So they actually grow new neurons. This is huge because we thought that neurons were so specialized that they weren't able to repair or replace themselves in the central nervous system. So if we could figure out how they're able to increase their brain size in the fall, right? And then in the spring, when the food comes back, going in the spring and summer, their hippocampus part of the brain shrinks in size, right? And this is probably due to that, the fact that this nervous tissue is energetically expensive to maintain.
So there's um, lots of evidence that we might be able to do the same thing with our hippocampus. So in humans, unfortunately, bad news for stressed out college students, stress causes the hippocampus to shrink. So if you're stressed out chronically in fight or flight, you're gonna have a hard -er time learning new information. So they've discovered that when people are really stressed out, their hippocampus gets small. It actually also gets small in Alzheimer's patients. That's kind of a different issue, right? But they lose the ability to remember stuff. We might have known people that go through these really stressful periods in their life and they can't remember anything, right? And so like maybe it's a divorce or the death of somebody that's close to them and their hippocampus will actually physically shrink in size. And so there's ways that you can help to prevent that, and it's all the ways that you can help to reduce the stress levels in your body. So if you can reduce stress levels, then you're probably more likely to be able to learn and make those synaptogenesis, make those connections between the neurons. Okay. So let's look at Alzheimer's disease. So Alzheimer's disease has two characteristics in terms of tissues. So two characteristics as a C, two characteristic tissue changes. So the first one is the buildup of amyloid plaques. And we've talked about plaques before when we were talking about atherosclerosis, but those were cholesterol, right, lipids underneath the walls of blood vessels. So amyloid plaques between neurons. And this is going to make communication across the synapse more difficult. The other thing is, is that you have tau tangles. And this is actually um, a part of the cytoskeleton in the neuron. That transmits nutrients from one part of the cell to another, as well as neurotransmitters. So remember the neurotransmitters are produced in the cell body but they have to be shipped, packaged and shipped to the ends of the axons. And so the tau proteins actually do that. So tau is just a protein that is part of the skeleton that becomes tangled in people that have Alzheimer's. So when you look at a um, tissue sample, right, you see there's these protein buildups between the neurons. And then inside the neurons, this darkly staining stuff is the um, tangled up cytoskeleton that is not able to function in transport anymore. So what would happen when a person gets this is that they then um, start, their neurons start to die. So when the neurons start to drop, die, the brain actually shrinks, okay? So the neurons die and the brain shrinks. No, this is characteristic of Alzheimer's. So there's other forms of dementia, yeah. but this is characteristic. So if you're trying to figure out if it's just regular dementia or if it's Alzheimer's, then you could look at tissue samples after they die. My grandma was diagnosed with vascular dementia, which they said was like Alzheimer's, but like. Vascular might be because of lack of blood supply to the brain. So this is specifically due to those protein buildups and the tau tangles. Yep. So dementia, it's a form of dementia, but it's not all, all dementia has this, right? And so this is what happens is that the brain gets more holes, gets holes in it as the cells die, like in the hippocampus region, right? And it actually shrinks, right? And so people lose the ability to like even walk at the very end or even swallow, and then they get put on life support 
and they eventually die. Okay. Okay, so I think I'm going to stop there for today. And we're going to next talk about the different types of neurotransmitters. And then we're also going to talk about how drugs influence, like normal drugs, prescription drugs, but also drugs like heroin and cocaine and other drugs and how they, how they influence the brain.